Schatten hier drin, ja? Oder ihr Not? When Ken Williams, the head of Sierra Online, asked me to become involved in the interactive game industry and to put together a, a real-life story, uh, Police Quest IV, uh, I jumped at the opportunity because uh, it was an opportunity to give people out there the real experience of becoming a police detective. The idea was to get um people that are very experienced in their professions and have them infuse their, I guess, decades of experience into a computer so that we can make the uh, person sitting in front of their computer pretend to be that person. To my knowledge, this is probably one of the first that was based on reality, one of the first that uh, you actually, you know, as you played the role of Sonny Bonds, who's the main character, you know, in the game up through Police Quest III, um, you had to actually, you know, take the character and you had to think, you know, like a police officer in order to get through the game. Realism. Right from the beginning we said we weren't going to do TV cops, that we were going to get real cops involved and um, even the original Police Quest 1 was used in police departments for training. The procedures were almost identical to a lot of the stuff that we have to do as regular police officers and uh, it was kind of uh, funny because, you know, being a game so-called a game um, that uh, you had to follow procedures otherwise you'd uh, get sent back to the academy or get chewed out by the lieutenant on the screen or uh, you know uh, if you didn't follow the right procedure you'd get in trouble you know or get written up or something like that just like you would in, in real life. Daryl Gates and myself um, together we have over what 50 some years of um, police experience you know in our background and the important thing, and I think that the thing that has made Police Quest series, you know, as successful as it is today is because of the realism that we put into it. And, and the only way that you can put the realism into it is to have been there and have lived it and have experienced it yourself. Well, you get to see a lot of my experience. You also get to see a lot of uh, experience that comes right from the uh, homicide detectives. These games require you to to start from step one and work your way uh, all the way to the end and and make the right decisions along the way much like in real police work everything's got to feel exactly the way it would in real life and otherwise it's, it's not real I mean it's just it's just a story and we don't want to do that we want to try to re-simulate real life on a computer the police have all the authority that they need they have the ability to take a person's freedom from them. Uh, on certain situations, they have the ability to take uh, a person's reputation. And under certain circumstances, uh, they have the authority to take a person's life. It's an aw awesome responsibility that the police have. Uh, 
but they need uh, to be able to do that in a context that uh, supports what they do. They cannot ever be allowed to take the law in their hands, in their own hands. They have to have a reverence for the law at all times, and they have to be looked at uh, very, very carefully to make sure that the police of the nation don't get out of hand. And the fact that we have community policing, that is, it not, does not come from the federal government, comes from each of our communities, allows us to control our police much differently than you find that control coming from any other country in the world. Community policing, where each individual city, each individual county, each individual state makes the decisions on the kind of policing that they want. I think that some mistakes were made initially uh, in that investigation. Uh, first of all, I was very critical of the fact that um, someone very up high made a decision not to arrest O.J. Simpson uh, when they had a warrant in their hands. They waited to, until the next day to serve the warrant. Actually, uh, they said they would allow the attorney to bring O.J. Simpson in. That is not uh, and has never been the policy of the Los Angeles Police Department. Again, somebody got stars in their eyes and thought this was the way to go. The result, of course, was the fact that uh, O.J. Simpson uh, left, uh, and everyone knows the story now, going down the uh, freeway with the Bronco, in the Bronco with uh, all the police uh, following him. And that put police officers in, uh, in tremendous jeopardy because you can imagine uh, what would have happened if O.J. stepped out with a gun and pointed it at the officers. So they would have had to, uh, to probably shoot him. Uh, if he had shot himself, uh, that would be a tragedy. So the officers were left in a very no-win situation. So that decision that was made, again, not by detectives, not by police officers, but by some of the brass was a poor decision and I think uh, uh, a, a, a decision that led to uh, one of the great uh, media events of our time. <laughs> the state has charged O.J. with murder, and uh, they have, uh, in my judgment, very, very good evidence to support the, that charge. Uh, if you just stop and think about it for a moment, uh, we have all of the DNA evidence that uh, everyone's talking about, and uh, a few years ago we didn't have DNA. Uh, we simply had uh, serology, we had blood types. Think about it. You have O.J.'s wife is killed. You find his blood type at the scene. You find her blood type on some socks in his house. You see a blood trail. His blood type, her blood type. You have blood in the Bronco. How many times do you have blood in your car, particularly on the night that your wife is murdered? I think if you put all of those facts together, pretty clear that he indeed uh, is the one responsible for that, uh, those two murders. Now, whether or not he uh, will be uh, convicted uh, depends on whether or not uh, these defense attorneys are able to uh, cloud the minds of reasonable people, whether or not they are uh, able to take away from what we believe to be reasonable people their common sense. Uh, if the jurors apply common sense and apply uh, the at common sense to the facts that is being presented by both the defense and uh, the prosecution, I think uh, a conviction is possible. But reasonable doubt uh, certainly can be placed uh, and it might occur. Legalization of drugs uh, has been raised as an issue uh, many times, suggesting that it's a way to solve the drug problem in America. But think about it. Uh, if you're going to legalize drugs, if you're going to have government supplying drugs, uh, what kind of drugs are you going to supply? Are you going to allow the government to supply heroin, cocaine, if, if cocaine, crack cocaine, uh, speed, uh, some of the designer drugs? Are you really going to have the government provide to uh, an availability of drugs of all kinds to young people out there, to adults out there? Uh, the answer is, of course, no. We can't do that. Everyone compares uh, the drug usage to prohibition. And the facts are that during prohibition, little known facts, during prohibition, the kind of crime that causes fear in America, the assaults, the, the rapes, the murders, the, the robberies, the burglaries, that kind of crime was at its lowest ebb during prohibition. 
fact, all during the history of this nation, when the sale of alcohol was down, crime was down. Uh, you hear about uh, all of the crime in Chicago during Prohibition because of the uh, people who were uh, pushing um, liquor in those days. And the gangs were pushing liquor. Well, they were killing one another. But they were killing uh, the common folks out there. And again, the crime rate was the lowest in our history. And so why would we want to legalize uh, narcotics and dangerous drugs? When you look at the problems that we have in this country with alcohol, why would we want to add another burden and an extremely more difficult burden for the populace to handle than alcohol? Alcohol gets you drunk. You feel bad the next day. Drugs, you feel good. And you continue to feel good. Alcohol, you may develop a habit. Drugs, in almost every case, you develop a habit. It would be the end of America, in my judgment. And um, I don't think we want to see the end of America today. So whenever you hear about legalizing drugs, say, hey, down with that idea. It's a lousy, terrible, horrible idea. Furman uh, came on the department uh, long after I did. I was an assistant chief uh, when Mark Furman came on the department. Uh, I knew Mark Furman, uh, just happened to know him among the many detectives that we had. Uh, very fine detective, a very good homicide detective, a very aggressive detective, uh, and uh, I think uh, has uh, been treated uh, very badly. I think Detective Furman did a m remarkable job uh, when he was on the uh, witness stand. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, give him a few pointers, uh, and uh, some people that I knew also gave him uh, pointers. I don't know that he needed the, uh, those pointers, but you have to understand that he was under tremendous pressure. And so it was uh, important for him to at least get the support that I could provide to him and that others could provide to him so that he get up there and tell his story uh, and uh, not, be, uh, not be berated uh, by uh, the defense. The principal pointers that we gave to Mark Furman was to continually remind himself that uh, he had a story to tell, that he was there to tell nothing but the truth, those things that had happened, and to be proud of the things that he did. And, and not allow the defense uh, to uh, get to him. Not allow him to, uh, because he's going to be accused of all kinds of things, the racial bias, uh, and he had to keep his cool. The main thing was to keep his cool and to remind himself that his job is simply to give the facts, ma'am, uh, whatever those facts might be. Actually, an investigation of a celebrity's death uh, should be no different than an investigation of anyone's death. Uh, uh, we, uh, and I think the police do in every case, have uh, a great reverence for human life. And so therefore they want to do their very best to investigate every death of a human being. Uh, when you have a celebrity involved, you have a lot of the media attention. And so uh, I guess uh, because of that, uh, the police probably spend a little bit more time knowing that they are going to be under the spotlight, if you will, in everything that they do. And so perhaps they spend a little more time, or a little more careful in the investigation, uh, but I hope that they're no more thorough, uh, that they do not take uh, a celebrity's death any more serious than, uh, than the average person out there who does not have celebrity status. Death of any celebrity uh, develops a certain uh, life of its own, and in the case of Marilyn Monroe, that has uh, developed a long-lasting life of its own. Uh, there's been, I, I can't, I can't uh, enumerate the number of uh, theories about her death. The facts are uh, very simple. She took her own life. Uh, she decided uh, at some point to take enough pills uh, and alcohol to end her life. Now, she had made these attempts before, no one had uh, talked about them. Uh, they had not been played up, but she had done this before. She had been on drugs for a long period of time, prescribed by her uh, psychiatrist. She had been under psychiatric care for a long period of time. She was uh, very, very unhappy over uh, her career and exceedingly unhappy over her personal life. And whether or not she intended to kill herself or whether she intended simply to take enough of the drugs and then be rescued, which often is the case of somebody like Marilyn Monroe, 
uh, we'll never know. Uh, the facts are that she took too many drugs, too much alcohol, and that ended her life. And there's nothing more to it than that. A lot of discussion about my retirement uh, after this incident. And quite frankly, um, one of the reasons that uh, I stayed uh, as long as I did was to simply uh, tell everyone out there that, hey, I'm not about to run. Uh, if you notice, there's an awful lot of people, bureaucrats, uh, politicians, who at the first sign of danger, they run. Uh, I didn't believe that was the, the appropriate thing to do. I believed it was uh, important to stay there, to stand by my people, stand by the Los Angeles Police Department, uh, and to, wherever I could, let people know this was one incident that did not demand the kind of attention that, uh, that, it, uh, that, it, that it, it got. It was a serious incident, but we'd had serious incidents before. We had taken care of those incidents in a, in a, 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 a way that would have been uh, much more uh, disciplined than the way that uh, this one was handled. Uh, as I said, it almost destroyed uh, uh, a police department, uh, almost destroyed a city. And uh, when I believed that uh, my stay was going to be harmful for the police department any longer, I left. Uh, that was, uh, I might point out, 13 years after I had full retirement. In other words, 13 years before that, I could have retired with full retirement. I saved the city about uh, a little over a million dollars by not retiring in that period of time. Well, I was uh, there uh, the first night of both riots, uh, the one in 1965 and uh, the one in, in 1992. And quite frankly, uh, the one in 1965 was uh, much more difficult, in my judgment, to deal with than the one in 1992. Uh, the riot in, in 1965 uh, had people shooting at the police uh, far more often uh, than you found in 1992. Fires were, sw were set uh, in a large 54 square mile area uh, and uh, while there were many fires set in the 1992 uh, riot uh, they were much more confined uh, to uh, to a city area uh, in my judgment uh, had LAPD responded the way it ought to have responded we could have put that riot down in 1992 much more quickly actually uh, even though a videotape showed one intersection, and, and people need to remember that uh, that one intersection, which was videotaped like the Rodney King and then uh, broadcast throughout the world, that was only one intersection. And while the police did not respond as they should have at that particular intersection, there were literally hundreds of other intersections where the police were responding, responding well. The 1992 riots were over and done with in about... Uh, about 48 hours, uh, about 50 at the most. The Watts riots took five days to quell. And once again, uh, I was there in, in both of them, and uh, 1992 riots, I thought, were far less uh, of a problem than the 1965 riots. Well, unfortunately, the Rodney King incident became a media event almost immediately. If you, if you think back, uh, we were all going home at night uh, looking at the Gulf War. Uh, that was a war we, we saw in living, breathing television in our, in our living rooms every night. We were so anxious to see what the next episode was going to be. And suddenly the Gulf War was over, and we had nothing to see except for the fact that Rodney King occurred. And so the electronic media made uh, a very, very big issue of it. They broadcast that over and over and over and over again, and then they print media had to catch up. And so the print media, in their own inimitable style, did their best to catch up. And they did all of these uh, side pieces and side issues uh, regarding the Los Angeles Police Department. And as a result, uh, you had a terrible media event that almost destroyed a police department and ultimately almost destroyed the city. Race was raised in the Rodney King incident uh, time and time again, but it was raised uh, by those who simply wanted to raise the race issue. Now, a lot of politicians in Los Angeles, uh, a lot of uh, community activists uh, wanted to interject uh, race into that incident. It was not a part of that incident at all. And I think the best evidence of that was the fact that there were two others in that car with Rodney King, both were black, both were handled very, very quickly and very easily 
No uh, force was used because uh, they responded to the commands of the officers and uh, they took them into custody with, with no problem whatsoever. And uh, so there's nothing racial involved in this uh, incident except that which was interjected into it by the politicians and by community activists. Uh, the acronym SWAT stands for Special Weapons and Tactics. Uh, when we originally came up with the uh, acronym SWAT, uh, it was going to be Special Weapons Attack Teams. And uh, that was my acronym. And uh, someone wiser than I was uh, said, no, you can't say attack. And when I thought about it, I thought, you're right. That is not what we want to project with SWAT. Uh, that's a life-saving uh, program. It's a program where we go in and protect people, not take their lives unless it's absolutely necessary. So it became special weapons and tactics. Well, it's very difficult, uh, and it's becoming more difficult to prepare for terrorist attacks. Uh, if you've noted, uh, the White House now has employed uh, many, many devices, and now they've closed off Pennsylvania Avenue. I think every building, public building um, now in the nation, you'll see barriers being set up so that uh, carriers such as a truck cannot get uh, that close to uh, the building. We almost had uh, a very similar incident that occurred in Los Angeles uh, a couple of years ago. We had an individual who was upset with IRS, uh, which we, most of us are. Uh, he placed a bomb of exactly the same dimensions as the one in Oklahoma City that went off, but his didn't go off. And only through the, the grace of God and a very bad uh, wiring job on the igniter uh, caused it not to go off. And it would have blown up, uh, we are convinced. We took the, the bomb out to the desert and blew it up. It looked like an atomic bomb. We believe it would have taken out uh, about uh, a whole business block in the city of Los Angeles. Fortunately, it did not go off, or that would have been the first terrorist attack. The force is a subject that everyone thinks they know everything about and they don't. Uh, the law says you can use that force which is reasonable and necessary. Only that force which is reasonable and necessary. And you fit that reasonableness and that necessary element into the situation that you're dealing with. This calls for good judgment. And it also uh, sets in motion uh, a situation where the police officer who is wrestling around uh, in the gutter with some guy uh, that may be stronger than him and it maybe is losing the battle, uh, his force and his belief that the force that he's using is very reasonable and very necessary, but somebody observing from the outside may say, oh, he used too much force. So it's a very difficult issue, not clearly defined, but again, that force which is reasonable and necessary. Los Angeles Police Department had in, uh, in force, uh, I think, a good policy uh, in the use of force. Uh, one of the problems has been, and one of the things that I objected to a long, long time ago, was using the baton, the, uh, the police baton, uh, the PR-24, uh, in the escalation of force, using it at a position which I thought was much lower than was necessary. And I think that's one of the problems that we, that we faced in the Rodney King situation. The officers uh, were, because of a decision made, a political decision made by the Board of Police Commissioners and the City Council, uh, were uh, to use that kind of force. That's how they were trained. Uh, and it came out very bad on the videotape. It looked uh, much more brutal than it was. Uh, and what I'm referring to before this, we had a policy that allowed our officers to tie up with the suspect, to take him into custody by using what we called upper body control holds. Those were eliminated uh, several years ago, and the baton was placed in, uh, in the position of being where the upper body control hold, holds were used. Um, think about it. We give our military all kinds of sophisticated weapons, to keep the international peace, we give a police officer a prehistoric weapon, a club, a club, if you will, to maintain the peace. Seems to me it's time we put our uh, collective knowledge, our technology together and give the police uh, some kind of adequate uh, tool to deal with uh, these acts of violence that they're faced with.